Hello again. Hi. My name is Laura Ray. I'm the Outreach and Instructional Services Librarian here at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Thank you again for attending this wonderful event. Um, I'm pleased to introduce to you Abby Elder. She is the Open Access and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Iowa State University. There she coordinates outreach, instruction, and professional development programs on topics related to open access and open education. She is a member of ISU's Open and Affordable Education Committee, a cross-campus group working to support the use of free and low-cost resources and in innovative teaching practices in the classroom. Her main research areas include scholarly communication in the humanities and social sciences and models for encouraging faculty adoption of scholarly communication innovations. She is currently studying the prevalence of businesses that integrate open educational resources into commercial educational technology platforms, which will be the focus of her talk today. Abby will be presenting virtually via Blackboard Collaborate. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can, Abby. Okay, thank you. Hello, it's wonderful to be talking to you all today. Uh, as Laura said, my name is Abby Elder, and I'm the Open Access and Scholarly Communication Librarian for Iowa State University. Today I'll be talking about the proliferation of commercial actors in open education, and especially the growth of these businesses and platforms over the past three years. But first, we'll start with a short overview of what OER are. Open Educational Resources, or OER, are educational materials that are free to access and openly licensed to enable easy use and reuse of the materials. Speakers like David Wiley, major leaders in the open education movement, have broken this down into two main components of what makes something an OER. They're free plus permissions, free of cost, and free of most restrictions on use and reuse. Now, OER can have a cost associated with accessing the material, but this is usually the case for print copies of materials because they have to be produced physically. You have to pay for that physical appearance. And yet, some commercial providers of OER content have begun reaching out to institutions to sell access to OER, the online content, not a physical copy, for a price. In the example here, Newton Alta sells their packages of OER for around $44, which is about above average for these types of platforms. So what happened? Well, a few things, but I'll start with what these companies are doing to sell these OER packages first. These prices don't come out of nowhere. Businesses didn't just decide to start selling access to previously free OER. It wouldn't work for one thing. What they are doing, as Nicole Allen notes in this quote, is wrapping open content in a platform or product and selling that platform or product to students. This process called open wrapping isn't a problem in itself if the content within the platform is still free elsewhere or if the platform only adds certain functionalities that aren't necessary to pass class, that's all right. The problem is when this is the only way students are told to access their course OER, or when the open content within the platform is not made free to access in any other way because it's been edited or rearranged in a way that makes it different from the original OER it's taking. It's the newest edition problem all over again. And these platforms are integrating existing OER, usually OpenStax textbooks produced by Rice University. So who exactly is doing this? You might already know or guess who's trying to profit off of open content. A lot of it is the usual suspects. Large textbook publishers know the business well. Folks like Cengage, McGraw-Hill, and Barnes & Noble are very prominent in the commercial OER game. However, it's not just these folks who are involved. There are also businesses that were created solely to promote their OER platforms, but ones who've been supporting the open movement for years. Folks like those at Lumen Learning and Pan Open have been working in open for a long time, and although some of the things 
these non-publisher businesses are doing aren't ideal, it's not all bad. So now that you know a bit about who's doing this and how, what exactly do they offer? Why might someone buy into this model? Well, they say they offer access to OER in a commercial platform. Usually, they market this in two ways. In the first uh, method, they say their platform is improving the OER by making it easier to use and easier for instructors to adapt, addressing barriers that have been identified in major OER surveys. You can see an example here of the type of advertising from Cengage's Open Now product website. The statistics they're quoting here come from the Babson Online Learning Survey released in 2017. They're saying, oh, you've identified these problems. We have the answer. Another marketing angle these platforms use is to say that the resources they add to OER improve the teaching and learning experience so much that it's worth a price. It's not going to argue, for, I'm not going to argue for or against this assumption. In some cases, I think it is true. Having more functionality on an online platform can be really great. I might point out open platforms similar things, though, and I'll save that for questions at the end. You can see this example of marketing from Barnes & Noble's LoudCloud software, where they call their learning platform Advanced OER. They're taking this second approach, but adding in what might be perceived as a slight dig at existing open educational resources, saying what they offer is a step above what we're producing. So I started this section with what do they say they offer? From that wording, you'd assume that's not really what these companies do. However, although these platforms market themselves as Answer to all of OER's problems, and that might be a little bit off, it's not wrong to say that they do offer OER with added bells and whistles. Depending on whose product you're looking at, these can be just an OpenStax book with added interactivity. They can be a curated list of OER reformated into one product. Or they could be quizzes, interactive elements, homework questions, all put in a textbook to make it more like a traditional online textbook you get from a publisher. There's a wide range of variety, and I want to point that out because those of you interested in actually using one of these platforms should know to look into each of them carefully before making a decision one way or the other, especially when the difference in price for the platforms can be, although not staggering, certainly noticeable for students. It can be confusing when you get a marketing email from a company saying, your state or campus or campus system supports using OER, we offer OER, you might not know how they integrate the resource into their platform, how they delineate OER from their premium content, or even if they do draw a line. Some of these companies try to warp the definition of OER to be both low cost and no cost. So in their opinion, what they sell is OER. This is a little annoying as someone who has to answer questions from faculty about what OER are and how they work. And it's especially concerning as someone trying to build standards for OER access through these platforms at my university. What helps is when a business is transparent about how their open educational resources are integrated into their platforms. I like using them in learning as an example because their open texts are open and accessible and free to access online. And they make clear in their marketing that what you're buying is functionality and tools, not the OER themselves. You know what you're paying for. Speaking of which, uh, here's a graph I put together on the minimum and maximum cost for a selection of commercial platforms containing open content. I have a link to the spreadsheet that has this information at the end of my presentation. Most of the platforms on this list meet the standard working definition of what counts as low cost, being under $40 or $50. And some are even below $20. So these resources are a step up for relative affordability, and that's how they've gained a lot of interest over the past two to three years and much longer in others. Calling themselves OER though, I'm not sure if that counts. Besides their messaging to consumers about what they sell, folks in open education have also had some issues with the marketing tactics of a few of the companies selling commercial platforms that contain OER. For many of these platforms, they just do what they normally do. They send information to faculty about what they offer, reach out to the university library or bookstore with information about their products. But some, 
some take a not so usual approach. One notable example was when Cengage sent emails out to students using their platform and asked the students to fill out a form that would auto-generate emails to their instructors, asking them to use Cengage's OpenNow and other Cengage products in the future. Or in a few similar cases, when campus liaisons to the bookstore bought pizza for the student government in a bid to get them on their side and sell the idea of these paid platforms with OER. It's not always the normal thing, and it's sometimes a little bit skeevy, to say the least. Now, I do have an extra slide just to say this is not everyone. In fact, most of the folks I've looked into have not done anything that, that bad. Some, like Lumen Learning, who will be the number one example of how to do this right, have done a great job of making clear why they charge money for some of their products. It's not to make a profit, not with their prices, it's to be sustainable, to grow their services, and to provide more support and more high-quality content to be paired with OER, not to replace it. So is this new business model a good thing? Can integrating OER into a paid platform be perceived as a step in the right direction? It could be. It really depends on how it's done and how well the platform acknowledges the open education movement, the history of OER, and what open educational resources are. But the astounding growth of all these platforms, I think that's a good sign. The Harvard Business Review defines disruption as a process in which a smaller company with fewer resources is able to successfully challenge established businesses. As the big guys focus on improving their products and services for their ideal market, they exceed the needs of some segments of the market and ignore the needs of others. Think about faculty in environmental studies or in graduate programs, teaching with a hands-on focus. Textbook publishers these days tend to follow a specific format and pattern for getting their content together and getting it out. By following that standard every time, they're not supporting every educator and they're certainly not supporting the needs of every learner. When this happens, a new product, something with a similar audience, but a new way of approaching their problems can start getting a foothold. And as more products are developed and quality increases over time, the product can become mainstream. Just think about how MOOCs and OER were perceived seven to 10 years ago, and look at them now. The final sign that disruption within a market has occurred is when the old businesses start conforming to the new model. Cengage is trying to sell OER. That's their pitch. You want OER? We have OER. This is why I think even if these business practices aren't always the best, and I do not approve of all of them, it could be a good sign because OER are having an impact, enough to create new businesses, new business models, and to make the big established publishers consider branching out into open content, whether what they sell is open or not. Disruptive innovation is a bit of a buzzword in open access and open ed. People don't like bringing it up much because most folks don't really understand it. I'll be the first to admit I do not understand it completely and I am not a business person. I know OER hasn't really disrupted the textbook market yet, not to the same degree as cell phones or iPods changed their markets. But there's some good signs here too. And changes in the business models of established companies aren't the only good signs either. Some of the new businesses selling platforms that contain OER are also trying to give back to the community. Lumen and Lyrics Learning both added incredibly important resources back into the OER available with their open textbooks in all sorts of fields. Some of these commercial products are actually just doing what they say they're doing, trying to provide a better experience for faculty and students who want to use OER, but also want some extra support and different platforms available like they're used to getting. So why is this business model so confusing and so concerning for people in the first place? Why is this a point of contention? If these platforms are affordable and they aren't destroying anything by wrapping up copies of open content in commercial platforms, the old OER is still there, why are we concerned? Well, it has a lot to do with the origin of the open education movement. I've been working on a literature review of early open education and MOOCs and the ideas swirling around in that space, and a lot of the references look back to the open source movement as a focal point. Open source software and open source licensing, sharing content with practitioners and learners and people who just want to work with your code, 
It was a gamble back in the day, and it is astounding that it worked so well. There's a thriving community of folks working in GitHub with Python, Jupyter Notebooks, sharing their code and their resources with one another and building on each other's work. The freedom of that, the sort of utopia of the commons, were the first triggers for the modern open education movement, as it is today with Creative Commons licenses and repositories and LibreText's amazing remix tool. So having businesses come in and try to monetize that work and improve upon it but not share their improvements back with the community, that's what started to concern people in the community. So here are some concerns we have and next steps we might take. I mentioned open wrapping at the beginning of this talk. The idea of wrapping up open content paid platform and locking it down. There are other words for similar processes like open washing, calling something that isn't open an OER, and FOPEN, again, playing off the fact that OER is trending and calling a paid resource open when it's not. What's concerning is companies can do this because even with the open education community within us, some groups use a different definition. For example, institutions like Penn State have adopted a definition of OER that says they can be low cost or no cost. For these colleges, there's no worry about Newton's $44 OER textbook because it's still under their $50 low cost threshold. But for most people who know what an OER is and have been working in this field for years, seeing folks try to change the definition to make their platforms count is very concerning and rightly so. It could undermine what it means for something to be open. Another concern that comes from the presence of this business model is the idea that open education could fall into the same sorts of problems that open access has with the hybrid model. Now, I'm foremost an open access librarian, so I'll provide some background on this for those of you who don't have that history. For those who don't know, open access publishing is when a scholarly work is made immediately free and open access online. However, hybrid publishing is when a publisher who normally charges a subscription access fee to work to access their work, allows authors to pay a fee up front to cover the cost of making their work free for others to access. This way, the company doesn't lose revenue and the author can know that anyone who wants to read their work can. The problem came about when the hybrid model became the standard. If you ask some folks today, what is open access publishing? They'll say, it's when you pay a publisher to make your article free to read instead of charging a subscription. But you don't always have to pay for open access. Some open access journals have no fee, and some that have a fee is just to recoup, recoup publishing costs, not to keep revenues up. This disconnect happened when the publishers established themselves as leaders in open access, and when they began bending the definitions towards the methods they use. That's what OER advocates are worried about happening now. Still, there's a lot we can do as administrators, educators, and consumers to ensure that even if we support these businesses, we do so in an informed manner. One way would be to consider the CARE framework for OER stewardship, a set of standards for people working in OER, and a set of standards I'd like for the businesses selling platforms that contain OER to live up to. These include contributing back to the open ed movement, so maybe sharing out some of the materials you create or that you change on your platforms. Attributing, providing attribution to the content used, shared, or adapted appropriately. Sometimes this isn't done, and technically that's illegal when you're using something with Creative Commons license, but I won't get into that. <laughs> Releasing the content openly outside of proprietary platforms. And empowering users and creators to engage with their OER in different ways. By pushing these fr this framework for standards, we can have the platforms and these businesses actually make a change within the community and outside of it, and not just take what we have and make it work for themselves. Some platforms are listening, they're making changes. This is a company that started off just doing software where you answer questions in class, but that has now moved into the OER sphere, says, initially users wishing to access OER on the Top Hat platform had to pay a subscription fee. But in April 2018, the company announced that it would no longer charge any fees to read free content. It seems like that's an obvious change to make, but it was still a big deal when so many of these other folks are not doing that. 
So on the Top Hat platform, they have premium content and they have free content. But when it's free, it is free. You don't have to pay for the platform itself just to read free content. And I think that's one step in the right direction. But it would be nice if more people made that step. So here's some final questions. And I will say right up front, I do not have the answers to these questions. But I wanted to share them as some talking points for you all at the end of my presentation. It's something to think about. How much should the users and producers of content control what others do with it? If we want to be open, if we want to give other people the power to change and update and remix our content, should we also hold back rights so that people cannot sell them? And are open licenses hurting the movement by allowing commercial use? Or are these adaptations and additions going to help further our work by getting people involved in the movement who would like more bells and whistles on their OER? It's something to think about. So I've ended a little bit early, but I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, here's my contact information for those of you interested and a Google link to the spreadsheet I mentioned earlier with information about a lot of the platforms I talked about today. Do you have any questions for me? OK, Abby, I don't know if I'll have to repeat them, but uh, we do have mics here that we're going to pass around the audience. And um, we'll see if you can pick up the audio from those. OK, thank you. Thanks. Abby, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, so, hi. Um, thank you for an awesome presentation, first of all. I learned so much. And I really appreciate that. Um, I work at Ohio State, and we're actually developing a um, test bank uh, platform in cooperation with Penn State that will um, be free and um, uh, that will that will develop free content, be free to use, and be easy to access. But actually, um, we are not um, we're at, we're at odds with um, licensing concerns um, for that content. So it's going to um, not technically be openly licensed with a Creative Commons license. Uh, but I'm really interested in um, the care framework and how we can address concerns um, outside of that model. And so I was wondering if you had some examples of um, perhaps how some of these other um, businesses or um, institutions are um, talking about how, how they're adhering to that framework, um, if there are any examples of that, so, um, so that we could look at that and, and see how we could um, make sure that we comply with that as well. OK, so you're thinking about the CARE framework and how it applies to the work that other folks are doing? OK. Yes. <laughs> so a couple of people have specifically aligned the work they're doing to the CARE framework. Uh, on the spreadsheet I have linked, I think it was oh, Lyrics Learning or possibly Top Hat have on their own web page a list of the care framework pieces and then paragraphs about how they're aligning themselves to those standards. Other people have just done their best to sort of follow that message and they'll link out to that information. I think in general it's good to just acknowledge where you're coming from and why you've made choices you make. So I really like PanOpen because they have a definition of OER on their website that is clear and direct and explains the difference between the content you're paying for and what open educational resources are. I generally prefer it when someone who's creating something that is related to OER or improving upon OER will also have a definition provided so that folks know what they're talking about and it's not just being used as a buzzword. Um, I think it would be a good idea to look through the CARE Framework website. They've got some great examples listed along with the definitions of what their pieces are to show how you can engage with people in that way. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. It does. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, we got one more from Mandy. Hi, Abby, this is Mandy. Um, I was just curious if these publishers have to 
um, deal with people who've licensed their work under a non-commercial Creative Commons license? Are they, are all of those works just not included on these paid platforms? Mm -hmm. How do they deal with that? That's a good question. <laughs> so by and large, it seems like they're not using non-commercially licensed OER. It's mostly the ones that are CC BY. I think there might be one or two that are licensed non-commercial and they got permission from the author uh, because a non-commercially licensed, uh, with a non-commercial Creative Commons license, technically it means that the author has commercial, um, all commercial rights over the work. So it's not that no one can make profit off of it, but that the author has the sole right to make profit which means if someone else would like to sell access to that work, they have to go through the author and gain express permissions, just like you would with a traditionally uh, all rights reserved copyrighted work. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question in the back. Hi, um, I was involved in creating some open access material that used government data. And I'm wondering how that fits into this. Uh, are these companies really going to make money off, off of stuff that's been paid for by taxpayers? Um, how does that work? That is a great question again. Uh, so the easy answer is they make it work. They have a lot of experience with making money off of things that should be either common knowledge or easy to access. And most of the ways that they're trying to sell their platforms, even if the content itself is easily accessible online, is by selling the bells and whistles that are part of the platform. So this is an ebook that you can highlight. This is an ebook that you can take notes in. This is a platform that has adaptive learning capabilities. Those are the things that they're really trying to sell the content with, rather than the content itself, which is just locked into the platform. Anybody else? Yes, we have another question from me. Sorry, I have another question. Um, I'm kind of curious if you've heard any feedback from students, if they, if they like these platforms, if they feel like it's useful to have um, an attractive interface for some of these things, um, or if, that, if it's too soon to get that kind of feedback. It's a little bit too soon. Uh, in general, students, I don't think, t take much notice of the difference between a high-cost platform, a low-cost platform, and an OER. I think they just say, OK, this didn't cost me too much, and now I have access to it. Uh, some of them might think that particular platforms look nice or work nice. As long as it's not buggy, I don't think they notice one way or the other. Most of the time that I've talked to students about any of these products, uh, they've just said if there's problems. If there's no problems, they don't even think about it. Which doesn't tell much to answer your question, but. No, that's, that's kind of my experience too, thank you. Okay, we have another question in our back. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say those of us who work in a highly urban university setting, so settings where the majority of the students who are coming in are either non-traditional, living in poverty, or a combination of both, definitely recognize the difference between open educational resources. The biggest impediment I've found to getting students to use them is allowing students to appreciate their utility because they've been so ingrained with the it's not worth anything unless I buy it from the bookstore um, conversation that we've promoted that it's a bit unfortunate but integrating that stuff into the classroom itself and encouraging them to bring their own devices and access that material during class has been very helpful but my question for you Miss Elder is have you had any collaborations with learning management systems so those very expensive systems we already pay for at the university and using those to integrate OER accessible platforms within the LMSs? 
So I don't have a lot of experience with the paid platforms that you're using OER through uh, LTI or through uh, Canvas, Blackboard, or any of our other learning management systems. The experience I do have with those is usually through making existing OER uh, and importing them into the system. So we use Canvas at my university, and they have Canvas Commons, which is a sort of depository for different materials that can be openly licensed or not, and it's just a place to share your materials with other instructors that can then be uploaded into your own course with a click of a button. That's one way that we're trying to use the learning management system itself to help promote and share open educational resources between things. Although in the case where we do put things on that platform, we also put it on our institutional repository. So there's a version of it that it's accessible to people who use different learning platforms as well, like Blackboard. Um, with the other sorts of materials, it depends. I know some folks at other universities that use Lumen Learning in their uh, learning management system because the paid platforms are more likely to have LTI integration for actually making things be put into the learning management software in a more accessible and integrated way. But I don't have very much personal experience with that, so I can't answer with much experience uh, besides that. Abby, I'm going to jump in here. Um, just speaking from the Center for eLearning's perspective, we've had a professor simply link to the PDF of an open textbook in her course, and it didn't have any ancillary materials. She was creating them herself, her test banks, all from scratch. Um, so that's, you know, one simple method you guys could use to, to integrate the open educational resources in your Blackboard courses. Uh, but we also have content collection, and it has an institutional level folder which we could enable access to everybody. So if you're interested here at CSU, uh, please let Karen Lanzo and the Center for eLearning know so that um, maybe we could start sharing some content within those institutional level folders. Okay, we have another question in the back area. Hi, thank you. Um, I just was thinking, does the burden of making uh, materials accessible, uh, like ADA accessible, like does that fall on these publishers and uh, platform makers or the, the, the teachers and institutions delivering them? I've not personally experienced that in my own classes, but it occurs to me that that could kind of come up and be an issue. That is a great question as well. Uh, so I hate having to say that every time, but you all have amazing questions. Most of the time in my experience, the burden of making something accessible depends on who has the time and effort and willingness to do so. And I hate that that's the answer, but it is. Um, most of the time, if there's a good program developing the resource, so say at Iowa State University, we have a grant program for faculty interested in creating OER. We provide support services from the Office of Equal Opportunity and the Center for Learning and Teaching to make sure that the materials they're creating align with their learning objectives and are accessible. In cases like that, we are the ones who do that. But in some cases, it's just the faculty member themselves making a resource and doing the best they can. Sometimes it's harder to make that accessible and it's good to reach out to other folks on campus and those offices who work on accessibility to get support. But there are a few resources that have been produced that are not accessible and it's good to acknowledge that, that they have not been done to the best of the author's ability. And some of those are being integrated in these platforms with improved accessibility. It's not every case, and a lot of the folks who have these paid platforms are using OpenStax books, which are the cream of the crop, so I don't think they need much updating. But sometimes it is the paid platforms and the publishers making things accessible, and sometimes it's the university. It's a case-by-case -case basis. I just want to add, um, don't be afraid to go back to the publisher and ask them, please make this more accessible. We need more than searchable text in your PDF. I've done that a couple times and they've gotten back to us. So um, consider that option. OK, 
Okay, do we have any more questions for Abby? Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Abby, for presenting for us. That was very informational. And we'll have your recording for people to look at and reference later. All right, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Me too. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Hi, I'm Maggie Keel Morse. I'm a law librarian here at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. And the next session is Student Government and Open Textbooks The Student Perspective. We have a panel of three CSU students representing the Student Government Association. Giovanna Hanna is a sophomore pre med student majoring in biology and health sciences with a minor in chemistry. She is the Undergraduate Science Center for Student Government, a member of the Open Education Resource Committee, and she is working on the Textbook Hero Award, which will be presented to two faculty or staff members who have written their own textbook and distributed it for free to their students or have used open textbooks in their classroom. We also have Samia Shaheen um, is a fourth year student in the Honors College majoring in International Relations and Political Science. Samia is currently serving as president of the Student Government Association, where textbook affordability and open access are priorities for her among the many campus issues she works on. She has collaborated with students, faculty, and staff in increasing awareness on textbook costs and alternatives to save students money each semester. Then we also have Danielle Mihalcha. She is a junior, double majoring in international relations and political science, and she's in the 4 plus 1 Masters in Global Interactions program. Danielle is a, center, a senator in the SGA, and this past year she served as the director of academic affairs, mainly focusing on the Open Textbook Initiative. Danielle is working to increase awareness of open textbooks and get more students involved. The panel will be moderated by Marsha Miles. Marsha is the digital initiatives librarian at the Michael Schwartz Library here at CSU. Um, I just want to start out by saying thank you for joining us today and I'm going to be asking you all some questions and then we'll have a chance for the audience to ask questions as well. Um, can you tell us what got you interested in open textbooks? I could start off first. So thank you all for coming today. It's such a pleasure to be able to come before you and speak. Um, oh, can you guys hear me? Is this better? Okay. Let's move a bit closer. So my name is Samia and thank you all for coming today. Um, it's such a pleasure that Danny and Giovanna and I have the opportunity to come and speak before you on behalf of the student perspective. So the first question being what got us interested in open textbooks. So um, we often facilitate interaction hours as part of our role in student government and interaction hours are composed of going around campus and trying to gauge the student opinion on what would enhance the student experience here at Cleveland State. And overwhelmingly, a lot of the responses were textbook affordability and the costs of textbooks being one of the main issues that students tend to face on campus. Um, so going around and kind of speaking to students, we realized that a lot of students are struggling with these costs. And so also learning about the open access program through the library has been really helpful. Um, our friends at the Michael Schwartz Library have just been so proactive and so hands-on with us in trying to educate us in order to relay their information onto the student body. So the more information we obtained on open access material motivated us to continue working on that particular matter. And so by educating us on the open costs of, on the costs of open access material, we were shocked to see how much it saves students money and we were also shocked to see how many students or how many faculty members don't implement it and so our primary goal is just to advocate for that particular program um, we know that the Michael Schwartz library works largely with the open access um, incentive program that does allow faculty members to have an incentivized program to use that open access material, which I don't know who would decline that offer, but um, we're certainly looking forward to continuing working on this initiative. 
Beautifully said, Samia. <laughs> um, I think what got me into open textbook was more so the personal aspect of it. Um, I've been an SGA for the past two years, and being in student government really allows you to have a voice on campus more so than other organizations. And I, I've always, every year, students struggle with tuition, scholarships, trying to pay, um, you know, their personal dues, insurance, rent, and just having the cost of textbooks is just an extra level of stress that they have to think about. And I don't, I don't think that it should be that way. So I think having the open access textbook initiative, making students more aware of it, because not many students are aware of it, um, could definitely be more implemented better. Um, last week, last Thursday, I actually planned an event with Mandy Goodset. We had a student workshop to get students more aware of the initiative. And, you know, a lot of students showed a good amount. <laughs> um, you know, we have to start somewhere. And even if students just came to get a slice of pizza, I, I made sure they, they were aware of what they were getting the pizza for and <laughs> um, making sure that they are aware of what's going on and how this can benefit them in the best possible way. Hi everybody, <clears throat> I'm Giovanna. Um, so what got me into um, the whole um, spreading awareness of open education resources is, um, like Danielle, um, the idea that um, I can make a difference on campus. So it was more of a personal um, reason so personally whenever I go to take a class um, I'll look at the cost before I register for it um, whenever I'm picking a specific professor it'll depend on which professor is using which textbook and which textbook will cost more and um, so that's like a very big impacting factor for me and many other students so I realized that this was such a big issue early on in my freshman year so I actually approached my, um, the dean of my college, um, her name is Dean Bond, um, and she got me in touch with Glenda Thornton. She used to be um, the director of the library, and she actually um, gave me a position on the Open Education Resource Committee. And through that committee, I learned a lot about open education resources that many students can use that I personally wasn't even aware of. And um, I think it's very, very important that we spread that awareness to other students because, I mean, I didn't know about it. Many faculty and staff members don't know about it. So I think if we can spread the awareness, um, then this issue can be resolved um, in a really great manner. Um, and many students won't have to deal with those issues because a lot of students don't have that money because tuition's already a lot of money. Um, housing is already a lot of money, so another thing to worry about is textbook affordability, and um, hopefully we can make it so that students don't have that problem anymore. Thank you. Um, what impact do you think, and you've already touched on this a little bit, but what impact do you think textbook costs have on students in general? I'd be happy to speak on that. So we recently administered a textbook affordability survey to the entire campus. And so here at Cleveland State, we have over 17,000 students on campus. And the survey received about 1,500 responses, which is good. That doesn't sound like it's a lot, but that's pretty good for a Cleveland State survey. Um, so approximately, so the raw data that we were able to get was that approximately 40% of students declared that they are living paycheck to paycheck at the moment. Um, and when you put that into perspective, that just shows that living paycheck to paycheck means that you're focusing on things such as rent, clothing, um, groceries, anything that's like a basic necessity to you. Um, and textbooks are, while they are an integral part of our education here, it's, it's not going to be the first thing that students are looking to set money aside for, um, realistically, if you're living paycheck to paycheck. And so many students in the open comments textbook at the end of the survey, or excuse me, at the, omen, at the open comments text box at the end of the survey actually admitted that at the beginning of each semester, they're actually faced with the decision to 
purchase the required textbooks, as in purchase all of the required material, pay for groceries, or pay for their rent. Um, and so student, and then 30 percent of students actually declared to be paying between 200 to 300 dollars a semester. And so that just kind of allows us to reflect and think, well, okay, a majority of students are dedicating their hard-earned money to necessities that they need to survive on a day-to-day -day basis, and assigning these textbooks that oftentimes are raised from $50 to $75 per new edition really does hinder the ability for a student to actually purchase that textbook and to not be as prepared as they would be on the first day of classes, which then has an effect on their success during the course to follow. Um, and so this does have a very negative impact on students. I know speaking from my personal experience, I'm studying political science and international relations, and my textbooks don't usually require an access code, and we really focus mainly on novels, which, are, which tend to um, be sold a lot cheaper than like actual textbooks from Cengage or McGraw-Hill or Pearson. So I'm fortunate in that fact, but a lot of, I know Giovanna is studying, you're studying biology. biology, and so biology is a complete different ball game. Um, the STEM program and the business college here especially, uh, they do require their students to purchase access codes, which are often a separate cost from the textbook itself, and oftentimes it's not a very small difference. Uh, the access code itself could be between 100 to 150 dollars, if not more, and then the textbook is around the same. So that's just roughly estimating around $300 with tax for just one textbook in one course. Um, and that makes a large difference in a student's life. That's, you know, that's groceries, that's rent, that's anything else that a student needs to survive on a daily basis. And so when a student is faced with that decision, oftentimes many students will not purchase the required material. And that is, I wouldn't say that that's their fault. I would just say that um, that's just the hard decision that they have to make per semester. So it does have a very uh, hindering cost on students. Um, not only are textbooks expensive for you know STEM majors and major requirements, but they're very expensive for general education requirements. So students who write right off the bat go into college their freshman and sophomore years they have to worry about paying two hundred dollars for a lab book for a geology class that they don't even I mean they're required to take it to to graduate but that's not what they're studying and so I myself took a geology class and I had to pay almost two hundred dollars for a lab book and yes I learned a lot because I purchased it but had I not had the money I don't know if I would have taken the course or succeeded as well in the course you know, students, um, some students go blindly into a class and don't even purchase the textbook. Like, I, I've done this before many times, and somehow I, I got a good grade, but, <laughs> you know, not, not all of us get the education that we could have received if we had been able to afford it. Um, I think the scariest thing about not being able to afford a textbook um, is that you're going into a course and you're not going to have as many resources as maybe other students who can't afford the textbook will have. So when you're trying to learn the material and you're having trouble with it, let's say you can't reach your professor or you can't find resources online, like that textbook is the only thing that you have that w you would be able to refer back to in order to learn the material. And most textbooks do a pretty good job of that. So um, students who don't have a textbook don't have that option. So it could be detrimental to that um, student's grade. Um, I know many students who, um, like Danny was saying, um, go into a class and they don't purchase the textbook and they wait to see if they're really going to need it because of how expensive the textbook really is. Um, I, I don't think that that should be an issue because, I mean, a, an individual's education is just so important and a textbook, that resource in itself is incredibly important. Um, me personally, um, as a pre-med major, um, and many other majors, of course, do the same thing, um, we, we rely greatly and very heavily on a textbook, not just because we have to learn the material for the class, but also we have standardized tests, entry exams for 
graduate school. So I have to take the MCAT um, my junior year, and I have to learn all the material that I could possibly learn from a specific subject area um, that may or may not be taught in the class. And all of those resources are available in the book. So students who don't have that access to the book will not be able to review that material that may or may not be taught in class. So I think it's extremely important that students be able to have access to a textbook um, so that they have those resources in order to learn the material that you know, is very important to their education. Like you all have learned a lot about open textbooks and you've completed a survey, um, but what is Student Government Association doing to promote open textbook adoption? Sure. Um, so I have the privilege of being the student representative on Faculty Senate, and I think that advocating to Faculty Senate on behalf of the student voice is very critical. That is um, firsthand experience sitting in front of faculty and having the opportunity to actually voice our concerns to them. And the faculty have actually been very responsive. Um, you know, having the chance to speak to faculty about what they're currently doing is very eye-opening. And I think once they hear from the student perspective during these faculty senate, because I really do bother them. I mean, I mention open textbooks, and the meeting is like once a month. I mention it every single time. Um, so they've, they've heard enough of me, but I know that a lot of faculty have came up to me and wanted to inquire more about the open, in, about the open access incentive program. I think I'm stating that correctly. So that's when I have the opportunity to forward them to Mandy or to Ben, who's also on Faculty Senate, and they would be able to provide faculty with you know, more information on how to implement, implement an open textbook and receive an incentive as well. So, Kind of advocating on the student voice in front of faculty really helps because a lot of students, I mean, no average student is going to stand up in front of their class and say, well, this textbook is too expensive. Uh, many students just kind of keep their mouths closed and just either purchase it, don't purchase it, and just don't express their feelings on it. So, you know, being able to present in, in front of faculty senate has been, um, I think, very helpful since. And so we've also been, pro we, as students, I really utilize the reserve program at the library as well. So our Michael Schwartz Library actually has a lot of textbooks that they hold on reserve that students can use for two hours and then return back to the library. Um, and that's been really helpful as well. And a lot of students actually don't know about that program. So what we've been doing is actually telling students, well, if you're taking a lot of these general education requirement classes, their textbooks are most likely I think nine out of ten times are in the library on reserve with multiple copies. And the textbook, or the Michael Schwartz Library has also been very responsive in the fact that if they don't have a particular textbook, they're really good about um, pinpointing which faculty member might have an extra copy or perhaps ordering it if they have money left over. Did anyone else want to speak to that? That was um, very thorough. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so um, my personal project, I'm, like I said before, I'm in the Open Education Resource Committee um, with the library. And so when I brought um, my um, concern about the cost of textbooks to the Resource Committee, they told me about the Open Education Resources. And um, I learned that um, other, or a few professors here at Cleveland State are, um, are promoting open education resources. Um, some wrote their own textbooks and are, um, are making them available to their students for free. So my project personally is to present an award to these professors um, specifically so that it would promote other professors um, to write their own textbooks. So we want to make it an annual award and present it to professors who go out of their way to make sure that learning is affordable for um, their students. Um, just as Samia had mentioned, um, I think since we are advocating for the students, being that voice for students and speaking directly to faculty and administrators really gets our point across. Um, so I myself have reached out to faculty, faculty that have implemented some of the open textbook initiatives um, such as the theater department or the English department and speaking with them and asking for their advice on how I could reach out to other faculty in order for them to um, 
implement this program for their, their department specifically as well. So what advice would you give to administrators, faculty, and students at other institutions who want to promote open textbooks on their campuses? So I would certainly have to say that it's, it's good to approach this conversation by, by understanding that implementing open access material is not an overnight phenomenon. Uh, nobody, you know, no faculty member can just wake up one morning and think, well, I'm going to use an open access material, or uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to use an open access mm -hmm. textbook tomorrow probably not how it works. Um, it takes weeks, sometimes months, and sometimes even years to kind of collect the material that you want to use. If that's writing your own material, that takes its own research, that takes its own time to put all of that together. So we recognize that. Um, but we do also want to mention that from, the, from our student perspective, it really does help promote academic integrity. And that is kind of a topic that students kind of hesitate to bring up because we are students and we do have fellow classmates that get by their classes by using a lot of online resources that might not necessarily be the most, I don't know what the word is, but the most um, fair. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say that, I, I don't want to mention any textbook brand names or any typical companies or anything, but a lot of those answers, frankly, are online. And so I'm going to go out and admit that, that a majority of these test banks and homework questions that are in these main and popular and expensive textbook companies are just within a Google search, and they're usually the first three links that are on the front page of Google. So it's not hard to find. Um, and so that is really difficult um, in the sense that, yes, it is, you know, the student passes with a quick grade, but where is the learning aspect in that? I mean, you've paid this much to enroll in the class, so you might as well get something out of it. So that is just my advice to faculty that really are not as receptive or not as, um, not as willing to adapt to open access material, that the main foundation of your curriculum and the main foundation of your work relies on the fact that, yes, you do have your academic freedom to teach your course in the way that you choose, but there's also the academic integrity of the students that's at, at risk as well. And if that is being neglected, then, well, you get through August to December having learned nothing because the front page of Google was your best friend on Quizlet. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that is just my bit on that. Um, what I would like to say um, in terms of advice to faculty would be um, on the lines of um, I would recommend really doing your research on open education resources. So um, I know that when you're a professor for a class, I believe you're given like slides that you can use for your classes. And a lot of open education resources do that as well. And um, I think also surveying your students to see how they feel about the topic as well um, would be very, very useful. So maybe at the beginning of the semester, um, send out like a mass email with a survey asking your students like, okay, is this gonna, like, is this better for you? Um, how many of you guys are struggling to pay for your textbook? How many of you guys really, really need to use your textbook in order to learn? Like, do you learn better visually? Do you learn better from reading the textbook? Because um, every student learns a different way and many students rely on a textbook, especially the, if the professor's teaching style isn't the best. So um, I'd really, really um, recommend doing your research because a lot of students have different perspectives, but a lot of them have one thing in common, and that's that they all believe that textbooks are extremely, extremely expensive. Um, my advice would be uh, just, just be open to the idea of open textbook. Really think about that as faculty, it is your responsibility to ensure the best learning environment for the students. Also, happy Women's Day to all the women in here. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any other comments or anything you'd like to add before I open it up to audience questions? Thank you. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions for our student panel? Can we get some uh, microphones for the recording, please? Uh, 
Do you mind if I hold it? You're supposed to hold it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to come and talk with us. And it's clear that you also spent a significant amount of time preparing remarks. I appreciate it. Uh, oh, I, my name's Pam McVeigh. I'm from Ursuline College. Um, as a humanist, my experience has been, and it may be different today, the last time I checked was last summer, my experience has been that there is very little available in terms of open access uh, stacks for teaching history, which is what I teach. Um, and I will tell you that I have gone the route of written my, writing my own textbook for a class where the textbook didn't exist. So I really appreciate the fact that you have an award for it. Um, now, I think that that is not a realistic path to push for professors. And the reason that I think that it's not realistic is, first of all, it took me four years. So it's not going to do, you know, it's, it's a very long process. It's something that you have to be very committed to. And second of all, there's very few institutions that will promote you for writing a textbook. Um, so it's something that most faculty members, especially in the humanities, do after they've got tenure or even after they've gotten a full professorship. Um, certainly, I didn't try to do it until after I got tenure. Um, so it's, it's a very, I, I think it's a much bigger ask than you may think it is. Um, the other thing is, um, well, the, you know, the question that I would then ask is, how much money is too much for a textbook um, or for, for education? As, and this is really a very discipline specific thing for me. As a historian, many of even the original works and or novels or whatever that I would assign students would have to be taken in translation. And that means that the majority of any of the original resources I would have students look at are going to be still in copyright. Uh, so this is something that I've been struggling with. Like the medieval sources, I can often find a 19th century translation, which is sometimes very, not very good. Uh, but you know, the farther forward I go, or the, the less mainstream the work is, the less likely there is to be a good translation. So if I want to assign Thomas Hobbes, Sure, there's an English version of his Latin text, but if I want to assign uh, a 17th century French woman author, the likelihood that I can find a text that you can read for free is very limited. And this, this, is, a really, this is a real problem that I find, uh, it's, a, it's a real tension in my own teaching. Um, I have a class on women's history, and the, the most, like there is only one uh, there is only one thing written by a 17th century former Peruvian slave woman in translation in English. It's not cheap, but I don't want to, you know, that one woman's work is really important. And I, I'm going to stop belaboring the point right now, but, so, but I guess my, real, my question is how much is too much? And I guess what do you say to students who say, who, who think, uh, well, please don't give the impression to your colleagues uh, to other students that it's possible to do everything through open source. So thank you. Um, I completely recognize and respect and thank the fact that you did take four years um, to draft your own work. I think that that four years, I hope, did not go unwasted and I'm sure that a lot of your students benefited from it. Um, I, 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 it's hard to say. So like I said, I'm studying in the liberal arts college and so it's obviously not within our discipline, it's not as easy to find open access material, and we do recognize that. And so it might be easier for students in the STEM disciplines and then the business disciplines to have more access to different studies in a more aggregate scope, whereas for us, when I'm reading about Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, I can only have one textbook on that, and that's the textbook that I have to settle with, and my instructor really can't do anything about that. And we understand that, and we recognize that. Um, as far as how much is too much, I would have to say that it really just matters college to college. Um, we know that, obviously, in the STEM programs, it's not as easy to find a textbook under $100.
But I think what really does matter is how often are these additions being used and for how long? I mean, when there's a textbook that costs $300, but the instructor really likes upgrading that edition every single year, that's very, very problematic for the student because the student might have access to that textbook in the library or might be able to obtain a copy from a friend or even find a PDF online, but that those chapters and that coursework doesn't align with the textbook, with the new textbook, just ever so slightly. Um, and most instructors will often forbid that a student use the older edition because God forbid you use the older edition and you're not getting the same work when from my experience I've used an older edition and it was the exact same thing with the exception that like maybe five pages were off. But so that's just kind of my my statement on that. But I do recognize and respect that you know this is not an overnight phenomenon as I mentioned. You certainly can't um, force any instructors to take this into consideration but I do think that if instructors um, choose the material that they want to at least charge students and just use it. I mean, don't ask students and put in your syllabus that you require five different textbooks, but we focused on each textbook for a week. I mean, that doesn't exactly benefit the student in any way, and that's just a waste of their own money. I hope that answers your question. So we have time maybe for one more quick question, um, because it is time for lunch, so. and lunch. Okay, if you, when you were looking at colleges, well, if there was a school that had made a big commitment to open access textbooks, would that have swayed you toward looking at that school? You think so? I think we can all collectively say yes. <laughs> um, and I say that just because there have been a lot of students that even come to Cleveland State that enroll in programs such as TRIO. So I'm involved in TRIO. And some students within TRIO, um, it's like a first generation program for anyone that's not aware. Um, first generation or financial based. Um, and so a lot of those students are actually more attracted to the college or the university because of a program that provides their textbook material for them. And then that, in result, allows a student to be more prepared for their course on the very first day, rather than having to wait until three weeks in. And then it's just, it becomes a perpetual cycle, because not being prepared on the first day causes students to drop out. Those students that are at early risk for not having the requirements and the resources that they need ends up affecting retention and so it just becomes a perpetual circle. So I think at least having that material on the very first day of classes at no cost would be a very, very large appeal to the student body. All right, um, let's give our panel a round of applause. Thank you. Um, if you ordered a boxed lunch for today, there is a box with your name on it on the table um, outside this room. You're welcome to eat in here or the atrium. If not, we have a list of nearby restaurants um, on the conference site, and we will see you back here for the next session at 1.15.